Okay, uh, we just hit noon, so noon central. Um, you're all around the country, so whatever time it is for you. Um, but I wanted to thank Jay Cooper and Amber Dude Clark for agreeing to do this talk on the strikes from last year. Jay sure. Cooper is the founder of the Los Angeles Entertainment Practice of Greenberg Trarg and focuses his practice on music industry, motion picture, and intellectual property issues. He represents clients with recording and publishing agreements, actor, director, producer, and writer agreements in film and television, um, and all entertainment issues related to the internet and digital services. He has been listed in the best lawyers in America, entertainment law, music, entertainment law, motion pictures, and television since 1987, among many other accolades, and is an alum of DePaul Law. Anne Bridget Clark focuses her practice on transactional entertainment and media and intellectual property matters in connection with all aspects of development, production, distribution, promotion, and exploitation of motion picture, television, new media, print, and music products. She is a team member of Law 360's Media and Entertainment Practice Group of the Year and earned her JD from Georgetown University. Um, please remember to mute your microphones if you are not speaking. And um, if you wish to see Lee credit, whether because you're in Illinois or you're in a self-reporting state, please email me um, after the program and I will get you a certificate of attendance. Um, and now I will turn it all over to our great speakers, Jay and Ann. Thank you, thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, of course, I'm a proud graduate of DePaul. Uh, I went to DePaul uh, when it was at 64 East Lake Street. And in the building, fortunately for me, it housed both the law school uh, upstairs. I can't remember what floor it was, maybe the 12th. And the music school, which was on the third floor. So I was able to attend both at the same time because I had yet to make a decision as to what I wanted to be in life. Uh, Took, took a while, took a while, but here I am. Uh, <clears throat> I'd also like to uh, acknowledge and thank uh, our associate, Juliet Sobel, who is here, uh, my assistant, Laura. Uh, without, their, without their help, I, we couldn't have done this. We're studying a new world right now, the world of uh, uh, Google and, and the world of uh, the internet of of and what it's been doing to us and how how we can ma manage it. Uh, I want to start with a quote from Albert Einstein. That's one of my favorite quotes. The difference between genius and stupidity is genius has its limits, uh, which is a very true statement. Uh, so let me tell you about a few things. We're going to talk about the, obviously, we're going to talk about the two strikes that occurred uh, at the same time, the strike of the writers and the, and the strike of the uh, uh, strike of the actors. Uh, the main issue wasn't the only issue, but the main issue, of course, was the the use of, of the internet and in, 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 as a creator as a substitute, uh, the use of the internet to, to replace actors, the use of the internet to replace writers. Uh, they were fearful, very fearful and rightly so because it's been, it's been happening. And so they went on on strike to say basically that, the, the, that we're not gonna be replaced by the internet. We're not gonna be replaced by Google. We're not gonna be replaced uh, by what is happening today. We have to maintain our position. So the writers did not want to be, the writers did not want to be replaced by, uh, by, by the internet and the actors did not want to be replaced by the internet at all. Uh, so what do they do about it? I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with essentially the fact that the strike accomplished for the uh, WGA and accomplished for the uh, the uh, actors that AI was a tool and not a creator. It was a tool, and the actors did not want to replace by be replaced by AI. The writers did not want to be replaced by AI. So we're going to describe what the solution to this was ultimately. Uh, Notwithstanding, I must tell you, there are threats out there. 
that we have to deal with every day. Uh, so before I get into the actual facts of these two things, and you want to add anything at this particular moment by way of introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to virtually see you. Um, yeah, I think that introduction was great. Um, you, you you hit the nail on the head. I mean, the, obviously, the two unions, as we'll go into more detail, have slightly different issues and concerns. But, um, you know, it, it, briefly, too, we I know there's sometimes a, conf, a little bit of confusion about why do we need unions for, you know, creatives? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you a bit more about this. But in short, you know, the, the genesis of the actors union was because actors really basically had no rights and were, um, you know, indentured servants essentially to studios. Um, and then I, you know, everything's progressed since then, but every time the, uh, a strike happens, you know, everyone kind of harkens back to that. Um, but there still are, you know, as you'll, as you'll see, with, they may not be the same concerns as before because the unions have worked very hard to protect their members um, to make sure their working hours are good, et cetera. But um, the needs of the members of these unions are ever evolving. And, um, you know, they're really this, this, this issue, this particular issue, and there hadn't been a strike, and there certainly had been, a, been not been a strike this long in many, many years, but it's because this, this new um, concern, which we're all trying to wrap our heads around, um, was of such, such huge um, import to, to, both sets of creatives. Right. So the, and you want to go ahead and start with the, the writer, the actors, I'm sorry, the act, and the issues that were faced, the actors were facing at the time. I I think, do we have the guild first in our, in our, um, well, well, I wanted to, I think the, the, that the WGA may be first in our slides, but I do okay. want to quickly just do a little um, nod to what we are talking about here in terms of the, in terms of the AI situation. So, um, you know, as, as Ju and, uh, and again, as Jay mentioned, uh, nod here to Juliet, who was the one who, who worked on actually generating these fun AI uh, tidbits here. But, um, you know, if you ask what, what caused the writer strike, uh, ChatGPT is not very helpful because um, they apparently can't predict the future. We know that, but um, they don't have anything, any way of helping us. So. AI is what you make it to be. You have to, it's not just you ask a question and it's all there. You have to feed it prompts so it knows, has, has a little more information about where to search. But even with that, um, it's kind of the Wild West because there's no way to know that the, whether the information you're being provided with is actually true or not. And um, I think all of us may have heard about uh, earlier, I think it was in 2023 um, in New York State, where there were lawyers who were sanctioned by a judge because they had uh, actually submitted a brief that included cases that did case citations to cases that did not exist because they had used chat GPT and um, chat GPT made up cases. It, it answered the question they asked, but didn't know how to actually fact check um, the sources like a lawyer. So you, you, you have to train it. You have to can keep asking it the questions to get the answer you want, but you never really know uh, without doing at this point anyway, your own research um, to know whether it's correct. And the data that you're uh, amassing, the data that the AI programs are using um, could or could not be, we, it's hard to tell, copyrighted and often is copyrighted information. So you, you, even if you train it as, especially as lawyers um, and chat, and these tools will be helpful to us. There's a lot of good that AI can do. We, we can use chat B GPT, but at this point we can't just use it uh, to, to, um, to do our own work. So uh, as the slide says, it's only as good as the set, set data used to train the algorithms. Um, and, you know, there's, we can go, I think, to the next slide now, but I want to give a, a couple examples of, so here's so, here's a few pictures of Jay. I did not know until uh, Juliet provided us with these pictures that Jay had a former career as a very dashing international spy, but you can see that. <laughs> from photos. Uh, we also got a few pictures of, of me, and um, I apparently am really, I have a cleft chin, which I didn't know until I saw this, and very interested in the latest in um, spacesuits. 
So, uh, you know, I, I don't know that that necessarily represents our personality. That's a few of the things you get with images. Then um, here's a bio on Jay Cooper. Uh, Juliet at first just asked the question, who's Jay Cooper? It was a, a rather strange result she got. And then just to see what happened, she said, I know Jay Cooper. Um, and she gave a, a little bit more information and then saw what came up, including um, that he was a former bodybuilder. Um, <laughs> He, he had long, he was known for his long flowing curly locks. And sure enough, as long as she said, Hey, I know the guy and these are facts about him. Then it, it spat those facts, facts back along with some things that are, are true, but definitely it's not a full picture of Jay Cooper. And it is a manipulated as, as were the actual photos of, of Jay and myself. Well, also, also they hear they, some of the notable comp clients are Michael Jackson Elton John, Frank Sinatra, Tom Jones, Madonna, and James Taylor. Of that list, the only one is one of my was one of my clients was James Taylor. None of the others. Uh, although I had worked for Frank Sinatra as a musician, I never had represented him as a lawyer. Uh, uh, and another another one that we went on and found out about me uh, had a lot of information like this, and also had me dead some years ago. <laughs> uh, I assure you, I'm still here. Uh, so, uh, and that moves me into a situation where I've got on a major client right now, because Google, Google goes out there and tries to find the the right picture of a celebrity, the correct picture of the celebrity. So Google approached us I, we, uh, for one of my clients and said, "Look, there's a lot of photos of her out there." Uh, we'd like to be go ahead and take them down and have them taken down. As they raised an interesting pro, uh, interesting dilemma for us because if we authorize them to take it down and they make a mistake and they take down an authorized photo, which is easy to do, then they, and along with the client, could get sued. We haven't found a good solution to that issue because uh, we don't want to say we don't want to authorize Google to take down their photo. Uh, and then when they take down the wrong photo, there is a, there is a lawsuit about that, which we don't wish to be involved in. Uh, it's a problem that we're wrestling with right now. Uh, and so we have not authorized Google at this particular time to take down those photos, but they're gonna do it on their own agenda. Uh, a, a, a tough problem. Uh, because identifying what is true and what is not true is very difficult on the internet right now. Uh, so uh, jumping into the writer situation, the writers basically, their, their agenda was, we don't want to re be replaced by AI. Uh, we we ha we need to be protected so that we are not replaced. They can't make us uh, uh, do the work on a story that was created by AI. And there are reasons for this. Uh, a writer that's co considered a professional writer uh, has had to have a story by credit, a screenplay screenplay by credit. Uh, and remember, there can be more than one uh, writer on a screenplay. There can be more than one, one writer on a, a story. Uh, those are the decision as to who gets the credit on that is done by the guild in a, uh, uh, a hearing. They, deter they determine who gets the story by credit by reviewing all the materials that are submitted. And what it was determined because of AI what was determined because of AI is that while they may be able to use some information from AI, AI does not get a credit as a writer. Credits determine what the income is for these writers, what, what, they, what they receive. Uh, and, and it also gives them certain rights, uh, cer certain rights to the, to, to the future, uh, based on the screen credits that they get. So always when the screen credits are awarded to the writer pursuant to their, their negotiation uh, 
with the with the uh, with the guild. I sh uh, the guild. Remember, the guild comes in after the fact. Um, all the information, the writer's material, and everything else of that nature is then submitted to the guild for the guild to make a determination of who is entitled to story by credit, screenplay by credit, of something of that of that nature. With, with those screenplay credits and story by credits comes a certain amount of minimum amount of fees, a substantial amount of fees, and also some. Uh, additional rights that they have, which was publication rights, dramatic stage rights, sequel rights, uh, reacquisition rights, uh, re uh, sequel payments. The guild determines who gets what is called separated rights. There is a document that is 25, no, at least 25 pages long, uh, possibly longer. Uh, I know it's 45 pages. I'm sorry, it's 45 pages long. That the, that you have to read to determine uh, how the guild approaches and grants uh, grants the rights to a writer to have these rights. In order to have these rights, the studio must pay what they call an upset price. Upset price means they have received a certain minimum amount of money that grants the studio. Uh, that is that the studio must pay to the writer, which uh, for the writer to have these up uh, these these rights that come after the fact. They're very important. They're worth a lot of money, and they're worth a, a big future for for the writers. Uh, the issue over and over again was AI is not going to replace me. AI is not going to be replace me. The writers want to be in the position of controlling those rights in, in every way possible. So the uh, finally, the uh, studios agreed that the whatever you get from the internet cannot be called a writer, that the AI cannot be entitled to royalties, that th th that they have approval over what AI is being used by the writer, but the writer is the one who is the one who gets the gets the rights <clears throat> and gets the credit, which is very crucial to to the industry because that's how their fees are determined. <coughs> Excuse me. That's how their that's how their future uh, screen credits are determined, and that's how their future deals are determined based upon what is what has happened. And you want to add anything to that? <coughs> Sorry, I was muted. Uh, no, I think that's a pretty good summary. Um, yeah, it's just the the importance of these of these separated rights that all come from the fact that you were the one who actually created the material, and and that can be proven by the chain of title that goes back to you know was there an underlying agreement. Uh, uh, sorry, an underlying um, work that you relied on, a novel, et cetera. Um, there's a de determination when you get credits, and that um, that's really the key to a lot of future rights and future compensation and monies. And um, that's why the writers were really wanting to get into the nitty gritty of, you know, how do we make sure that these rights don't disappear because uh, suddenly we can't prove where the source was or um, someone takes our material and, and runs with it. And we end up without that all important credit um, that is proven by having, a, you know, a, a being able to say, here's the genesis of this idea. Here's how it evolved. Here's my exact contribution to it. Here's, you know, my co-writer's contribution to it. Um, so, it, you know, using AI, allowing people to sort of run with it at will, really upends the traditional ability to um, to find out who to and to attribute um, and accord the proper credit to the writers. Yeah, the, also the, um, to the extent that any materials are submitted by the studio to the writer, uh, they must reveal if any of that, what they are submitting to them on the basis of what they're asking the writer to do, whether it's AI or not AI. Uh, uh, because again, what the writer is doing, and if they get a story by credit, 
or they get a screenplay credit. That turns into a lot of money, and, and it also in career, turns into career-enhancing uh, deals for, for the writer. So they accomplished a lot in this strike by that, by that fact alone, uh, whereby uh, AI cannot be determined as a writer. And that any materials that are submitted to the writer, which the writer may use uh, from AI to write the script, the script is still the writer's, and it is not a AI, and not the and AI cannot be determinative of any of that. Uh, that that was a big victory. Uh, that was a big victory for the writers' guild, uh, an important victory for the writers' guild, uh, and. To protect, to protect those protect those rights. Where it's going from here, we have no idea, but that's the status of it at this particular point in time. Uh, and you wanna jump into the actors now? Um, sure, yeah. So the, you know, SAG-AFTRA is the largest union by far and the people it represents are wide and varied, widely varied, because we have, you know, the actors that all of us are familiar with, um, those typically are considered, are, are working under what is known as a Schedule F contract, and that provides for a lot of negotiation, for a lot of sort of doing away with certain other protections that a day player might have or a background actor might have, because typically uh, Schedule F actors are, uh, have a team who are negotiating on their behalf. Um, so you might think, well, you know, they've already got the, you know, people, when they think of actors, a lot of time the public thinks these folks don't need a union. These folks are protected, but the vast majority of actors are not working under a schedule F, F agreement. They don't have a, a team supporting them. They don't have uh, Jay Cooper or, uh, negotiating their, their contract. Um, so uh, this is basically on behalf. And, and I should also add, the Guild not only uh, establishes the rules for uh, creative control, for work hours, for basic minimum pay, it also provides, and this, uh, this is the same with WJ, uh, people who are members of that union, uh, based on how much they're working, can also benefit from um, benefits. They can they have a health plan, they have a pension plan, so uh, it's, a, it's very important to them. And uh, on the other side, the AMPTP. Now, just to quickly explain, uh, the organization that's the AMPTP doesn't mean all uh, production companies out there. So you may have heard that there were certain productions that continued during um, during the strike for SAG-AFTRA uh, using SAG-AFTRA performers. Those companies were able to get a waiver. Uh, well, actually, it wasn't a, a waiver is not the correct way to say it. They were able to work um, to, to get permission uh, from the guild to continue with their production uh, because they were not members of the AMPTP, which represents the larger studios, larger production companies, larger streamers. Um, and they agreed to sign sort of a, a, to the terms of the existing sag after contract. So uh, I know there are some, maybe people think of it, you know, if you think of like a, a typical union strike where people seem to have like crossed the line and a lot of, you know, of the bigger actors bowed out of projects that they would have been able to continue with because they were covered under this independent type of agreement, because in their case, they had the ability to do that and it didn't look good. Um, some bigger name actors did do it. So uh, because they they wanted people to continue to be employed. So it's not when we're talking about what the argument is here and who's affected, there are there's a world of um, producers who were not members of this larger organization. However, once the new contract was agreed to, those independent producers would then be under that contract once they did their next motion picture. They, they were working under the existing contract. Um, they, just like any member of the AMPTP, any independent production company who hires a SAG actor has to be a signatory to the applicable agreement. And another quick aside um, for whatever this is interesting to you, if this is interesting to folks, um, there are different agreements uh, under SAG-AFTRA. There's an agreement for um, motion pictures and television. There's an agreement for documentaries. There's an agreement for commercials. Um, the commercials agreement was not 
uh, affected by this. People were still able to do commercial work. So this really pertains to the um, motion picture and television of it all, um, streaming services, et cetera. Um, so uh, going back to what the who it, the the guild consists of, there are the schedule of actors, the uh, the featured performers, if you will, and then there are the background actors. There's also voice over actors um, who are also covered by SAG. So uh, a little bit of a different interest here, but ultimately the, the same concern, which is that the same two concerns. One is uh, the actors did not want um, well to be replaced by by AI generated actors. They also did not want uh, there to be the ability to take their image, capture their image, and then run with it. Um, to use it in a film or to maybe use it in a way or in publicity um, that they didn't have any control over because uh, actors do, especially Schedule F actors, do have control a lot of times over which image is used in publicity in um, promotional materials for motion pictures. And if and and the way that usually works to get to the nitty gritty is that you send photos back and forth. You know, here's a batch of photos we have of you. Which ones do you approve? Um, and if the studio could just go out there and make AI photos, um, that would be of great concern to the actors. So they needed to build in, um, you know, sort of protections. For the background actors, obviously, as everyone knows, it's it wouldn't be the first time that there is generated um, background actors. You know, you everyone's seen the large scenes of a stadium, et cetera, where you know you're not actually seeing people because they've used some sort of um, digital, uh, you know, uh, uh, manipulation to do that. But this is a little bit different because we're talking here about scenes where you would see someone's face and you would need a background actor. They didn't want to be replaced. So um, moving on to the next slide, they basically what was determined is that they separated out these these two categories of of replicas, if you will. Um, there's the employment-based digital replicas, which is when you are actually engaged to be working on a, a, a audiovisual project, and they are that the the producer is capturing your your likeness and image, um, or your voice. And so, in that case, there has to be a clear and a clear written. Um, acknowledgement and uh, acceptance that uh, a grant of rights to the studio to to do this, to be able to capture your image um, and manipul manipulate it with with AI. Um, this can actually be useful in certain ways because it can, you know, I mean, it's not useful for stunt actors, a little bit of a separate thing, but stunt actors are also covered by SAG. But, um, you know, there may be situations where uh, it's a very dangerous, you know, potential stunt and you can, you know, save, you know, potential, say, uh, you know, get around potential safety issues. So there's there's some good uses here. But the bottom line is that the studio can't just go ahead and generate any AI image without the actor having said, OK, you can do that. Um, and then there's the uh, independently created digital replicas where a, they have not engaged the actor for a day to capture their image, um, where they've used something else to come up with an asset that um, appears to be a natural performer, but but it's it's not. And the uh, studio, I'm sorry, the production company, studio, et cetera, um, has not actually uh, used a, a, an actual person to, um, to use that likeness. So the concern there obviously is that if it can do, if they can do these ICDRs, if you call them, then why would you ever really need an actor at all? Um, so there's very, it's very limited where those can actually be used. Um, the third one is a background actor, digital replica, as we discussed, you know, you, you can't just do away with background actors entirely by generating these, you know, ICDRs. Um, you have to be able to, uh, you know, it, it, and I should also add, and I think, I don't know if it's in the next slide or in this one, but when you are engaging someone to do this, uh, to make these replicas, they have to be paid um, for the day of work. If you then, and, and if you're able to do the replica on that day, um, great. But if you have to do additional work to it, then you have to pay them a prorated uh, portion of their pay. So um, when you do the EBDR, you basically have to get at least 48 hour advance notice because a lot of times for day player contracts, 
um, or weekly player contracts, as opposed to the Schedule F, which is a longer form, more highly negotiated agreement. These are done pretty quickly. You know, someone gets a call from their agent or um, gets cast um, and then shows up on set pretty quickly. Uh, but they can't just, you know, you have to give someone a 48 hour advance notice um, and a clear, they have to provide a clear and conspicuous, i.e. written um, consent. And that can be in the agreement that, you know, a lot of people just sign like a one pager day player agreement that is a form. So either the, that would mean for us lawyers, for we lawyers, that we would need to, um, and the best thing to do would not just be to include it in your sort of form, but to have a separate uh, clear, whether it's in a box or otherwise, um, acknowledgement that's initialed by the actor so there can be no confusion about the fact that they were provided with the advance notice and have the ability to say yes or no. Uh, you can argue whether that ability actually exists because people want to get the roles, but that's a, a question for another day. Um, and then as mentioned, the compensation depends on, on um, when and how it's created. Uh, so essentially, you're not supposed to be using the EBDR to replace the performance, right? So um, you're using it when they are rendering a performance and then it's sort of enhancing whatever they're doing. So um, again, with a Schedule F actor, typically they'll, there are going to be protections they're going to want to negotiate about these kind of usages and how it looks and approvals. That's tough because typically um, there are very limited approval rights after, about how you actually look on film. You know, actors don't get a final cut approval of the picture to see what they look like. So this is a something that's a bit... Um, controversial. You may have heard that after the agreement that was reached and the, SAG, the the strike was over and everybody was thrilled, there were very vocal um, a, a kind of leaders of the actors community and former even um, leaders of certain um, either on the board or whatever of the actors uh, union um, that came out. Justine Bateman was one of them that came out and said, this, this protection isn't enough um, because yes, people can consent to it. Again, as I mentioned, that obviously depends a little bit on how badly you want to work or not. Um, so is it, is it, you know, a true consent? Um, and then, you know, how much, you know, what does this really look like on film? I mean, there's still some legitimate creative concerns of, as to whether the, the protections that are in the, the new agreement went, actually went far enough. Um, and then we can move to the next. Yeah. So then for the, for the ICDRs, um, this is a bit tricky because they there's there's no limit on what they, they can do with these. Um, but if you're using if you're using uh, somebody's image to create these, and th and this is this is tough, right? Because if you're I, I don't profess to be an expert on how AI actually works. We have other people at our firm who are the tech folks who 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 know more about this than I do. But there has to be an initial source generally for an AI generated. Um, image. So <clears throat> it's a bit tough because, you know, how do you prove actually where this all came from? If you see an image and it resembles somebody, you know, it's going to be a, a challenge to say, hey, that that one, you know, I, obviously an actor can easily say that image looks like me. I never, never gave my permission, but then there could potentially be a debate afterwards about what was used to generate that AI image. If you didn't use any picture of that actor, then maybe their claim is not going to going to go anywhere <clears throat> excuse me um so then there are also exceptions for uses that would be protected by the first amendment as i, I mentioned you know you can't if, if something is not copyrightable or if you need to use the we all are familiar with the concept of fair use um there's this doesn't this doesn't denigrate in any way the ability to use the fair use uh defense if you're using someone's image for or for example if you're doing a documentary on on ai and you're do, using an example of an ai image that was generated um you could it, it potentially have a fair use defense to to use an image of an actor in there without without having received their permission um so so the most important thing is that you can't use studios signatories to the the new sag agreement cannot just take a generate an image using someone's uh, an actor's image or likeness and and run away with it and use it in a picture if they are using if they're actually employing someone 
um, they have to get the specific permission from the actor to be able to generate an AI image or to use AI to manipulate that individual's image. And they actually have to compensate the person for that use. And I, uh, again, quickly to, to make the, the um, just to make the comparison, this in Schedule F agreements where the actors have the ability to negotiate and they're pay being paid a lot more money as their minimum salary, um, they that they don't have to, uh, the difference there is they won't get paid additional amounts for that use. They still have to approve it and say that they allow it to be used, but there's no additional payment. If you're a day player or a weekly player on a, a fixed rate, then you would get another day's pay or a prorated pay if you're a weekly actor based on um, you know the time that it took for you to both uh, be available for the image to be created and then for the image to later be manipulated. Um, so basically, as this slide kind of runs through here, the um, synthetic performers, it's, you know, we understand the idea of a replica, but this basically is, is sort of having you believe that an actor performed when they didn't. Um, so we, you know, we're able, like I mentioned, to sometimes know when we're seeing a, 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 a replica of someone, but this is not thinking that we're seeing a replica that was created from someone's image, but that someone is actually doing the performance. Um, and there is no, no one, but that person was never hired to do the performance at all. Uh, so that's, that's um, not allowed without the SAG actor's per permission. And then when they're using when they're using a specific part of the uh, facial features, because again we can make uh, an amalgam of somebody's face, but if you're using Angelina Jolie's nose to create an AI generated image, you need permission from Angelina Jolie. Um, you can't you can't just you know say well we we only used a there's no de minimis test here. If you use someone's features, then they have to have granted permission um, for that to happen. Uh, so. It, with res respect to compensation, if you were going to use someone to do that role, uh, then you need to pay some actor to do it. So you still engage the background actor as you would have engaged them in 1975, um, pay them the day rate, uh, and then you're able to uh, use AI to to do to change that image. But you still have to um, use that person if you would have typically used them. Um, Again, you know, this, this, as you can see here, there's a distinguishability here from a non-human character. Um, but as you can see, and, and you can understand why there's still a little bit of confusion about it, we don't know exactly how this will look. And there will be, there will have to be real world examples, um, you know, of, of how this will play out. Um, but that, that remains to be seen. I, I would predict that there will be <laughs> some updates to the, to the uh, agreement as we go forward. Um, uh, we can move to the next slide now. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I got want to jump in a, a moment and, um, and step back a few things that I, that I actually missed and I apologize. Um, uh, AI, the, the, what you get out of AI cannot be copyrighted by, by law. It was not created by, it was not created by a human being. And so, therefore, there's no copyrightability of of, of AI generated uh, write of generated writing. <laughs> also, uh, under the under the agreement now, uh, a writer cannot use AI in their work unless they get permission and follow the rules of the individual studio who hired them. Uh, so the, it's strictly regulated in this particular point. Is everybody following that? I can't answer the question because I don't know. But that is the rule. There's no copyrightability, and you cannot use, according to the studios, according to this agreement, you cannot use AI to to write. Uh, it, the, 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 you cannot get a copyright in it. Uh, so while the writers may be able to use the technology as part of the creative process, they have to get permission technically from the studio before before they do that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the if the writer is given ideas by AI and incorporates the ideas in screenplay, uh, it's not automatically treated as non-original or a rewrite. Uh, 
the writers are fighting to make sure that what they write or what they what they deliver is original so that they can share in what I already described as uh, separated rights. And those rights are really important and they mean a lot of money to writers. It also means a lot of control on future uses of what they what they have written. You cannot overlook that whatsoever. Uh, the uh, credits are vitally important to a writer. That's how they get future work. Uh, by having a credit as an original screenplay, original story, uh, or original teleplay by. Uh, so there has to be complete disclosure on what they've done and what, the, what they have used. Uh, the writer can use AI. They're allowed to use AI to some extent, but the studio or the studio has to consent to it. And they have certain terms in which the writer must comply with in order for the writer to use it. But, but there is no credit for AI. There's no copyright for AI. Uh, and this was the, the big, the big, the big, big uh, uh, area of controversy that the writers were fighting for so that their future is the uh, future is protected because their future is determined upon the credits that they receive on every project, whether it's film or television. Uh, it's uh, they're protected by the what we call the separated rights, which are many rights that they have uh, to uh, for uh, future uses of their work. Uh, and the, the agreement went a long way, a long way, uh, notwithstanding the studio's uh, demand otherwise, uh, to restrict the use of AI. For writing for writing purposes, uh, uh, those are those are the big those are the big the big takeaways that the writers came out uh, a winner in this particular man this particular issue and it means a lot of money to the writing community the writing community and does protect their rights in the future. I wanted to add something I, I didn't mention that I found to be very interesting was that and 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 shows sort of the good that AI can do. Uh, one of the exceptions to the um, ability to digi digitally manipulate or to use AI uh, for an actor's performance is to actually be able to change their lip movement for dubbing for foreign languages, which is fascinating. Um, uh, and opens up a whole new world and a whole new markets, uh, especially for people, you know, always, there's always an issue with foreign uh, markets because sometimes people aren't interested in, uh, you know, uh, reading the subtitles or uh, there's issues with dubbing of the actors. You know, again, Schedule F actors often will say, you can't dub my voice without, or if, so, or if there's an actor who speaks another language and they aren't Schedule F, they can say, um, I want the first opportunity to do a dubbing in a foreign language. Um, and so it's, it's really interesting because this will, this will be actually potentially great for, for the actors because no one likes to uh, have their mouth not moving along. It, it takes away from a performance if you're uh, being dubbed in a foreign language and it's clear that you're, you know, I don't need to tell anyone this. We've all seen it. <laughs> the old um, pictures we saw in the seventies on TV where the, the, the dubbing was laughable. And, uh, but in any event, so, so yeah, it's even today, that's going to make a very big difference. So that's one of the exceptions. Um, and that kind of shows that what uh, some of the benefits are of, of AI. Yeah. Uh tangential to all of this is um, protection of uh, actors voice etc uh, there are a statute there's a, a law in California there's a new law in Tennessee uh, whereby AI cannot use the, the voice of a, of, a, of a major celebrity whatsoever uh, without without permission uh, the statute in California and in Tennessee protects them their, their likeness, their voice, and their image. Uh, uh, and particularly since we have many uh, uh, deep fake issues at this particular point where somebody goes in and uses an image and then takes that image and places it in a context that was not, uh, that was not done originally. Uh, 
re replace somebody's image with another image uh, in whatever the context may be. There are laws regarding this um, and, and also the law concerning the use of a voice, uh, taking an Elvis Presley voice as an example, or another major stars or his voice and using it in, in an AI context. There are now laws on the books, not everywhere, but there are laws on the books in certain states on this to protect that. Very, 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 very important uh, to protect, particularly celebrities where we have this problem all the time. There was a, a case of years ago uh, that affected this. It was called the Bette Midler. It was the Bette Midler case in which uh, a, a company, a company, a commercial company came to Bette Midler and said, we want you to uh, uh, sing, uh, we want you to sing uh, on this commercial. Uh, and they couldn't arrive at a price so they went out and found somebody else who could have a voice uh, similar to or almost sounded like uh, to Bent Mittler. And they uh, uh, they did the commercial anyway with a sound alike, if you will. Uh, Bent Mittler sued. Uh, this case is probably at least 10 years old, if not longer. Uh, sued on that and won and said they had no right to, to use somebody who was a sound alike to Bette Midler in that particular case. Uh, that is similar to what the laws are now being enacted to protect uh, artists uh, and uh, vocal artists uh, uh, from imitations, from imitations by a uh, another by another person. Very important to protect their their rights in this case. Commercials are earn a lot of money for. Uh, celebrities, and we see over and over again where they are attempting to, to find somebody to, and there are very good people who do this, are very uh, talented people who do this, uh, to go out and find somebody to imitate somebody else's voice. And so that you, when you're listening to it, uh, you think it's that that particular celebrity. Uh I think we're about ready for any questions. And Anne, unless you want anything you want to add, add in. Uh, no, I would just add to, and it's based, it's a, a kind of echoing what you said that um, a, a little bit, there's nothing new under the sun where even though AI is sort of a wild frontier, uh, the concepts here are essentially um, the same that they've always been. Like you mentioned with the Bet 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 Midler case and um and, you know, another example is you can still do certain things that you were always able to do with background actors. You can use their image and then sort of tile it, use it, you know, mu multiply it in a background scene. Um, you can also use AI to do the editing that's always been permitted uh, for a motion picture to do color correction, um, you know, and to adjust the sound of someone's voice if, it, if you're missing, if you can't hear it clearly enough in post-production. So, um the, the basic concept is, you know, creating, uh, protecting the creative rights, always been the same concept. And uh, the new concept of let's make sure that we still have a job and we aren't, we aren't replaced um, by, by something that's generated by an algorithm and trained by associates at GT. <laughs> <laughs> as brilliant as they may be. Uh, please place your questions in the chat. This is a great talk. Um, I guess one thing I can ask is, what would you think is the strongest part of the agreement and what would you think would be the weakest part of the agreement? Good question. Well, well on the... On the SAG after side, I would say that it's really all still a bit nebulous because um, it's still going to be difficult to prove whether, even though we're, you know it, the the rule here is now that you can't use somebody's image to create a you know a, an AI uh, generated image without their permission, you know it might be hard to prove whether or not that was actually used, um, and that's where you'd have to almost go to involving people doing uh digital sleuthing uh and i i should add too that as i mentioned i think all this will evolve um part of the the uh 
new agreement for SAG-AFTRA is that they will meet, I think it's semi, semi-annually to talk about these issues. They requ- they've required themselves, um, which I've, has not been part of the agreement previously, to have meetings where the AMPTP and the um, Actors Union will sit down and and you know, discuss the issues that have arisen, arisen. And obviously the purpose of that is like, let's essentially, let's try and do a mediation every six months and make uh, adjustments as we see fit rather than, um, you know, not coming to the table and letting things come to a, to a head. So they're a little bit trying to, to head that off of the past, at least in the SAG-AFTRA world. I, I, I agree. I, I, a number of people uh, on the writer's side are not happy with the agreement. They don't think it went far enough uh, <clears throat> to, to protect them. It, it seems on the surface that it's a good beginning. Uh, uh, and I think they have to see how it works out. It'll probably take a couple of years for them to, to determine whether it's working or not working. When is the uh, next? I remember that there was a strike a few years, a few years ago, probably. And it's when when is the next possibility of a strike? Like when is the next agreement up? Uh, There's an other unions where the uh, IATSE, I think, was talking about a strike. IATSE are the uh, uh, technical workers on on the on the in the film, the drivers and the uh, uh, the camera people and things of that nature uh that that could be coming because they, they want a bigger piece of the pie too uh the uh, uh, the monies that increased for the writers and the actors pursuant to this agreement we didn't discuss that much uh was was substantial uh but uh uh they feel that they're not getting still a, a, enough of it and they don't have enough control. That's always going to be an issue between the studios and the and the uh, talent unions as to as to control and use of their product and, and their images. Uh, so uh, as an example, the, the rights that they have under the right under the Writers Guild uh, for the future, the separated rights uh, the separated rights, which are ex- which are ex- extensive, uh, uh, as to uh, future uses of future uses of their material, as to rewrites and reacquisition and sequel payments, uh, oh, which is determined by the guild. All of that uh, they feel can be can be improved. They don't think it was enough of an improvement in that particular regard. But as I say, it's a uh, 45 page document. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't addressed substantially in uh, in this uh, in, in this strike as as maybe some people felt it should be. And then um, both of the agreements are three year agreements. So they're up uh, in the middle of uh, both for WGA and SAG after they're up in the middle of uh, 2026. So that's not long off, <laughs> not very far off, and we can imagine uh, a lot will have changed. Um, but potentially, if they are, you know, staying on top of the issues, with I'm sure both parties want to, um, you know, we'll see. We'll, hopefully, we won't end up back in the same place as we are now. We'll know a lot. We'll know a lot more about AI in two years. I could be wrong, but I remember the last strike was due to internet and those royalties. This is about AI. What do you see as the next sort of hurdle that is going to be facing actors and writers? Well, we were we were focusing here on the AI issues, but um, part of the issues too, and I think this will continue to be um, of concern. And and Jay, who's uh, has vast knowledge in the music industry knows everyone who's familiar with the music industry knows they've been dealing with this for years, which is the issue of how do you calculate what someone's earning in terms of profit participation, um, even how are residuals calculated, um, both WJ and SAG after a members and DGA members are entitled to residuals based on the um, exploitation of the projects they worked on in another medium. So, um, you know, if you produce a film and then it's later sold, uh, to television or sold in foreign markets, 
um, they earn additional monies. And uh, as we are all kind of trying in our industry to keep abreast of the changes, you know, you know, in a matter of, of months, essentially, um, you know, I, I had an agreement where I have a client who had essentially started a in conjunction with a network, their own cable network. And by the time we had inked the deal and finished the long negotiations, all of a sudden streaming was upon us. Um, and that world is evolving. So I think a big issue will be compensation and um, how uh, the the creatives participate in the in the compensation and how that is all determined. Um, the streaming services initially had said had not they didn't want to let anyone know um, how many people were watching so uh, or what they were earning. Um, so they can't, they started a system of we're going to play you a, we're going to you know a bird in hand system essentially. Um, we're going to pay you a flat bonus instead of agreeing to pay you any net profits. And this bonus could end up better for you because, you know, maybe your show won't make any money. Um, so I think, and there, and there was a lot of discussion about residuals uh, in this, in this um, negotiation as well. So I see that being one of the main issues that will be ever evolving. Yeah. I'd like to even expand on that a little bit. Uh, one of the benefits that made a lot of actors uh, very rich uh, and, and and writers very rich was the percentage of the back end. Uh, when a movie goes into a theater, let's say it, it earns a billion dollars, as, as some movies have earned, uh, and the actors, particularly the the main actors, have a percentage. Uh, that's a big paycheck in addition to their salary that they receive. A number of studios who should remain nameless at this point have have come out with no more back end. And they create a they create a, a in the contract, I promise you this there, they create an interesting uh, scenario for a back end, which is, okay, we've negotiated your deal. We're going to take twenty percent of what that negotiated deal is, and we're going to call that the back end, and we're going to pay that to you over the next uh, two years after the release of the picture. That is not a real back end. It's a delayed payment of of compensation that was already earned. Uh, but that is causing great fury, actually, amongst writers, directors, producers, and everybody else in the industry, other than the studios themselves, because they were dependent upon this idea, particularly they were dependent upon this idea of, of the theaters and uh, doing a, a billion dollar gross or whatever the number is around the world and getting 10%, 15% or some number out of that percentage. That is a big cut down that has been going on now for the last several years and may, may increase. Uh, another thing which, which I alluded to earlier is the fact that the while the writers can use certain AI materials, uh, it's subject to <clears throat> it's subject to the uh, approval and the agreement of the studio itself. And there was no determination, there was no determination in the final agreement as to what those rules are. So that is yet to be worked out. And so the writers don't know what, if any, AI materials they can use for their writing. And the studio and the studios have not laid out what their rules are regarding that. That is yet to be determined and is going to be a big issue. Uh, now I can imagine because how you could just like with writing, especially with art, it would be one thing, but with writing, you could possibly just not tell people. Uh, uh, when you're talking about, um, so we are running low on time. Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, uh, if not, do either of you have any final thoughts or hopes for the future? Well, my final thought is the industry is always changing, always, always, always changing. It's never static. Uh, we learn it. We learn as we go. Uh, the, the, quite frankly, the the use and the ever presence of AI is going to increase, and we're going to, we're going to be learning as we go as to how we're going to handle AI. The use there's going to be more and more demand by talent, quite frankly, to use AI for their for their own for their own benefit and where it's going to go and how much permission will be and how it's going to affect economically our industry is yet to be determined. 
I second that emotion and how it will affect our own jobs. <laughs> You're correct. <laughs> but we'll start the lawyers union. <laughs> Well, there was. I read in one of the one of the AI articles I did read is that the the, the legal profession will be reduced by about twenty five percent at least over the next ten years. Uh, it's also replacing uh, another element of the industry: uh, arrangers and copyists. Uh, AI can actually arrange music. They can do the copying. They can print out the print out the music for an orchestration, and that's going to reduce a lot of the talent that is relied on those kind of jobs over the years. That is right. Okay. Um, well, I guess that is it. Again, thank you so much for doing this. This was great. Um, and yeah, if anyone wants CLE credit or just uh, email me. My email's in the chat. And we hope to see you at future events. Have a good Thank afternoon. you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.